A 7.2 magnitude earthquake hit Taiwan on Wednesday morning local time, killing at least 16 people and injuring more than 800. The Taiwan Central Weather Administration said that the epicenter of the quake was in the waters of the eastern coastline of the island. The quake knocked out power in several parts of the island. An eyewitness filmed rocks and earth tumbling down the side of Gishan Island, which they said happened during aftershocks to the massive earthquake. Meanwhile, officials in Taipei said that they have not received reports of major damage. The Chinese state media said that it was felt in Fuzhou, Xiamen, Huangshu and Ningde in China's Fujian province. Locals in Taipei were rattled after the quake. Taiwan's Central Weather Administration said the aftershocks could be felt in the city. More than 25 aftershocks were registered in the region. The tremors caused landslides in the eastern mountainous region of Hualien. Taiwan's fire department said that one person is suspected to have been crushed to death by falling rocks in Hualien. The area was the epicenter of the quake. Rescuers raised against time to help people out of a collapsed building in Taiwan's Hualien. The quake was the strongest tremor to hit the island in at least 25 years. A search for trapped residents is underway as emergency personnel walks through dark corridors while going door to door and calling out to residents in Hualien. At least 26 buildings have collapsed, more than half in Hualien. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen has asked government agencies to continue to pay closer attention to the situation in various places and initiate contingency efforts. The National Army will also provide support. The central and local governments will cooperate with each other to minimize the impact of the disaster. At this time, when there are frequent aftershocks, the government must ensure the accuracy of information and provide timely assistance to people in need so that people can feel at ease and safe. We are ready to work together. Japan has issued an evacuation advisory for the coastal areas of the southern region of Okinawa. It had issued a tsunami warning which has since been lifted. Japan's weather department said that tsunami waves of up to 3 meters were expected to reach Japan's southwestern coast. The Philippines has lifted a tsunami warning that it had issued after the Taiwan quake. And DD India's Chris Gilbert has more from Tokyo. Yeah, there's, there's a mixture of reports coming in uh, about the destruction. Of course, there are some absolutely dramatic images of, uh, you know, the structural integrity of buildings being knocked out from under them, you know, leaning to one side, fallen, partially collapsed. Uh, however, reports suggest that the uh, accessibility to the Hualien region uh, county uh, may be somewhat, um, you know, under repair already. Uh, the early reports were of uh, significant damage to infrastructure, bridges and tunnels. Um, there are a number of people who remain trapped. There are reportedly about 60 people trapped in a tunnel uh, north of Hualien, and there are about 50 people who are reportedly trapped in about four minibuses uh, in a national park. Uh, they uh, reportedly work in a hotel in that national park, were on their way to work uh, on Wednesday morning uh, when the earthquake struck. So in some ways of looking at it in terms of damage to infrastructure, or, or officials are saying it may not be as significant as originally feared. However, officials are stressing that they are still learning and assessing the scope of the situation. Uh, and, you know, these are absolutely the crucial hours for saving lives at the moment, the first 24, 48 hours. And so that is 100% where the focus is, uh, as well as getting aid and assistance to those who need it. And, as I say, uh, you know, urging vigilance because they are uh, expecting uh, earthquakes for the next week, uh, some almost as big uh, in some forecasts potentially as the one that hit uh, 8 a.m. local time in uh, Taiwan uh, on Wednesday. Uh, and so that can take already weakened buildings and completely floor them as we've seen around the world in the past. So vigilance is being urged.
China's eastern province of Zhejiang felt the impact as its neighboring Taiwan was hit by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. Ceiling lights were seen shaking and school children were urgently evacuated from buildings. Chinese state media reported that the quake was felt in both Xijiang and Fujian provinces, while witnesses also felt its effect in Shanghai. The epicenter of the quake was located just off the east coast at a depth of 15.5 kilometers. Moving on, NATO foreign ministers are meeting in Brussels on Wednesday to discuss how to extend military support for Ukraine, including a proposal for a $108 billion fund. The two-day meeting aims to have an aid package of $108 billion finalized in time for the NATO summit, which will be held at Washington, D.C. in July. The proposal by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg would give the alliance a more direct role in coordinating the supply of arms and equipment to Ukraine. Ministers will discuss how NATO could assume more responsibility for coordinating military equipment and training for Ukraine, anchoring this within a robust NATO framework. We will also discuss a multi-year financial commitment to sustain our support. And reacting to the NATO foreign minister's meeting in Brussels, Russia said NATO had returned to a Cold War mindset as the alliance marks its 75th anniversary this week. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peshkov said that NATO has no place in a multipolar world, which Moscow says it seeks to build in order to end U.S. dominance. President Vladimir Putin launched what the Kremlin spokesperson called a special military operation in Ukraine in 2022 with the stated aim of preventing NATO from expanding its footprint closer to Russia. As for NATO, the Russian attack on Ukraine has galvanized it. It has expanded to 32 members by admitting Finland and Sweden. Moving on, China's President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden spoke on the phone on Tuesday. It was their first direct talk since their meeting in November 2023. President Joe Biden emphasized the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and the rule of law and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. For his part, Xi said that ties between the two countries are beginning to stabilize but he warned that they could slide into conflict or confrontation. As Commander-in-Chief feels obligated and responsible for protecting the national security interests of the United States, and much of his conversation with President Xi t this morning, which was candid and constructive, very professional, businesslike. The United States has warned Iran not to target it over an airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Syria, saying that it had no prior warning of the attack. At the UN Security Council on Tuesday, Deputy U.S. Ambassador to the UN Robert Wood said the United States will not hesitate to defend its personnel and repeated its prior warnings to Iran and its proxies not to take advantage of the situation. Even as we continue to learn more about this incident, it seems clear that every member of this council should reiterate that all states, including Iran and Syria, have a responsibility to avoid the path of escalation, to stop arming and advising terrorist groups, and to rein in the actions of proxies who threaten regional peace and security. Meanwhile, tensions have escalated between Iran and Israel after a strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria on Monday. Iran claims that the attack killed seven people, including two generals. Tehran has accused the U.S. ally Israel for the attacks and has vowed retaliation. In some more news from West Asia, humanitarian aid entered southern Gaza on Wednesday, where people welcomed trucks carrying relief material. An Israeli strike killed seven workers from the charity World Central Kitchen on 1st of April. Israel has promised an investigation into the incident.
World leaders have condemned the deaths of seven aid workers in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. The world's central kitchen immediately paused operations in the region after the strike. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu described the airstrike as unintended and tragic. Meanwhile, the UK summoned Israel's ambassador in London to express its unequivocal condemnation of the killing of aid workers. Leaders from around the world expressed condemnation for the tragic loss of seven aid workers in Gaza in an Israeli airstrike. Among the victims were individuals from Britain, Australia, Poland, a US-Canadian dual citizen and Palestinian backgrounds. The attack occurred during a strike on their convoy on Monday night. Responding swiftly, the World Central Kitchen halted its operations in the area in light of the incident. World Central Kitchen... ...devastating Israeli airstrikes that killed World Central Kitchen personnel yesterday bring the number of aid workers killed in this conflict to 196, including more than 175 members of our own UN staff. This is unconscionable, but it is an inevitable result of the way the war is being conducted. U.S. President Joe Biden called the charity aid group's founder to share his condolences over the killing of World Central Kitchen workers in Gaza. We were outraged to learn of an IDF strike that killed a number of civilian humanitarian workers yesterday from the World Central Kitchen. We expect a broader investigation to be conducted and to be done so in a swift and comprehensive manner. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese denounced the attack. This is completely unacceptable. Uh, the Israeli government has accepted uh, responsibility uh, for this and Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, conveyed uh, his condolences. Israeli Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi apologized for the airstrike. An independent body will investigate the incident thoroughly. We will complete it in the next coming days. We will learn from the conclusions and implement them immediately. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu too described the incident as tragic and unintended. European countries including Spain, Poland, France and Britain condemned the Israeli attack on World Central Kitchen in Gaza. Britain summoned Israel's ambassador to London to express its unequivocal condemnation of the appalling killing of the kitchen workers, three of whom were British nationals. Meanwhile, Israel has long denied accusations that it is hindering the distribution of urgently needed food aid in Gaza. Bureau report, DD India. And in some more news from the region, protests continue in Turkey's southeastern province of Van after the newly elected mayor from a pro-Kurdish party was replaced with the candidate from President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's AK party. Hundreds of people took to the streets in Van, which is a Kurdish majority region. Clashes erupted between the demonstrators and police, which resorted to using water cannons and tear gas. Abdullah Zaydan was elected as the mayor in last week's local elections, but authorities prevented him from taking up the position because of a court ruling. Zaydan had received 55% of the vote, while the AK party's candidate got only 27 percent. Look, the first invested state-appointed trustee. Such a regime has not existed since the Turkish Republic was founded. Now, they are disregarding the will of the people of Van and trying to place another mayor here with another method in a completely lawless manner. This has no place in the law or the legal system. And still to come on DD India Live. At the UN, India praises the work done by Akshay Patra Foundation in ensuring food security and nutrition to millions of children. Boxer Vijender Singh joins the BJP, deals a blow to the Congress party barely weeks before India's general election. And India remembers Field Marshal Sam Manekshaw on his 110th birth anniversary.
We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds. We get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts. We demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I am Tanvita Tanija from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington DC. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. You're watching DD India Live. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. Now, India's permanent representative to the United Nations, Ruchira Kamboch, praised the work done by Akshaya Patra Foundation in ensuring food security and nutrition to millions of children. Ambassador Kamboch was speaking at the UN on achievements in food security, India's strides towards sustainable development goals. The Akshay Patra Foundation's relentless efforts in serving billions of meals celebrate and carry forward these cherished traditions. Akshay Patra has served meals to countless children, ensuring the makers of the world's future are well nourished. In the wake of a recent increase in attacks on Hindu temples in the U.S., a group of U.S. lawmakers led by Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy have written a letter to the U.S. Department of Justice to brief on the status of investigation into recent vandalism at Hindu temples. In the letter written by the members of Congress of Indian descent, Sri Thanedar, Rohanna, Pramila Jayapal and Amy Behra noted, that these attacks on the temples have contributed to increased collective anxiety among Hindu Americans. The congressmen also expressed their concern over the law enforcement coordination regarding these bias motivated crimes. All right, let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. India's Home Minister and senior BJP leader Amit Shah addressed a public rally at Muzaffarnagar in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh on Wednesday. Minister Shah was to also meet the party's Lok Sabha core group in Muradabad for talks on election strategy and key priorities for the state. Leaders are leaving no stone unturned in their campaign. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh held a public meeting at Ghaziabad in Uttar Pradesh on Wednesday. Minister Singh also attended the filing of nomination of the BJP's candidate Atul Garg. In a jolt to the Congress party barely weeks before the election, Boxer Vijinder Singh joined the BJP in New Delhi on Wednesday. The Olympian had joined the Congress in 2019 and lost to BJP's Ramesh Bidhuri from the South Delhi constituency in 2019. Congress lawmaker Rahul Gandhi on Wednesday filed his nomination from Vyanad in Kerala. He also held a roadshow in his constituency. In the 2019 election, Gandhi won Vyanad by a margin of more than 400,000 votes. <laughs> India, with its massive population, is a key player in global efforts to combat climate change. India is aiming for a 45% reduction in emission intensity. 50% renewable energy capacity by the year 2030 and a net zero target by 2070. A study supported by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor of India highlights the importance of energy transitions for the country's sustainable development. DD India's Tapas Bhattacharya spoke to the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, Mr. Ajay Sood. 
Joining me is uh, Professor Ajay Su, the Principal Scientific Advisor to Government of India. Sir, a new report has been has come uh, which says that India can achieve net zero by 2070. But there are other points that have also been mentioned. The first and foremost is 2030, uh, what India can do. And obviously by 2047, when can India become a developed nation? What are the major components in that particular report? Now, 2070 will happen obviously not uh, uh, not in a uh, day or two gradually so 2047 is like a in between place where we will not have the net zero carbon but we would have our uh, commitment to how much renewable energy non fossil energy we want to put it and so on now in the renewable one what is this report brings out which is important that uh, wind, solar, uh, hydrothermal, that is not enough to meet the uh, demand. Nuclear energy is a must. Now, this requirement or this uh, revelation or this outcome, it's not something very uh, uh, new because many other nations have also realized that nuclear energy has to be an integral part of this energy mix. This report also mentioned that you need 40 to 50 billion dollar every year uh, to achieve a net zero uh, by 2070. How you guys plan to do that? This is the way we have to plan our economy such that we also keep the net zero carbon target at the same time achieving the human development index and it would need resources as this report brings out these numbers of course are tweakable it's not uh, written in stone but it these are indicative and i have a feeling as the economy grows this can be done this can be done so that was uh, the principal scientific advisor saying that uh, it is high time that india put a nuclear energy uh, as a main thrust uh, when it comes to achieving the net zero target by 2070 with campus samunath mr this is tapush patacharya for delhi india from delhi india is remembering field marshal sam manikshaw on his 110th birth anniversary dd india's nandita dagar has more Sam Hormuz Ji, Fram Ji, Jamshed Ji Manekshaw, also known as Sam Manekshaw, was India's first army officer to be promoted to the rank of field marshal. He was born on 3rd of April 1914 in Amritsar in British India. Manekshaw joined the British Indian Army in 1932 and served with distinction during World War II and the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. He played a crucial role in India's victory in the 1971 war against Pakistan, which led to the creation of Bangladesh. Manekshaw was known for his wit and humour, as well as his strong leadership skills. Manekshaw's leadership during the 1971 war was widely appreciated and he was hailed as a national hero for his role in the creation of Bangladesh. Sam Bahadur passed away on 27th of June 2008 in Wellington in Tamil Nadu. In New Delhi, this is Nandita Dagar for DD India. All right, now take a look at some other stories making news in India. The Indian Air Force on Wednesday said it had recently received delivery of the first indigenously designed and developed crash fire tender. The CFT has been manufactured by a NOIDA-based Indian MSME firm against a contract worth $34 million. India's Health Minister Mansuk Mandavia chaired a meeting on Wednesday to review preparations to tackle heat-related illnesses because of heat waves in the following months. The minister emphasized the importance of creating a central database with inputs from states to share field-level data on the heat wave. In IPL, Delhi Capitals will take on Kolkata Knight Riders in Vishakhapatnam on Wednesday. Delhi will be aiming for its second straight win. It broke a two-game losing streak by producing a fantastic performance against reigning champions Chennai Super Kings on Sunday. The victory gave the Rishabh Pant-led side a truckload of confidence. On the other hand, KKR boasts of a 100% record in the IPL so far. It has won both its games in the 2024 edition. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of DD India Live. Let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. You can also check out our website ddindia.co.in. 
We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. From all of us here in New Delhi, thanks for watching DD India Live.